Joanne is, uh, well, by her uh, own description on her website, author, ghostwriter, and former Forbes business journalist. Uh, we were talking uh, at lunch today about how that term ghostwriter has, well, we thought sort of a negative connotation, uh, perhaps from a different era. In any event, it doesn't really capture what she does. And of course, that's what she's here to talk with us about today. Um, I think this is a particularly interesting message for our students who now go into so many different, well, industries and jobs with their skills. And this is true whether they come out of um, journalism or come out of integrated marketing and communications. Uh, but what she does is she helps people tell their story, find their voice. And this is something journalists can't typically do because they have too much ego. And marketing people can't do because they have too little. Um, it takes an exceptional talent to do this, and um, that would be Joanne. Uh, she comes to us uh, here in October after having a particularly successful summer. Uh, I discovered last summer when I was standing in the line at Starbucks, I saw the name Joanne Gordon on the, the new book by Howard Schultz, uh, Starbucks uh, founder and CEO, and I said, it's got to be, and it was. Um, uh, the book that she co-wrote with Howard, uh, Onward, How Starbucks Fought for Its Life Without Losing Its Soul, has since last summer been translated into 13 languages and hit number one on the bestseller list at the New York Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal, and USA Today. Uh, and then in June, uh, Amazon selected the book as its best business and investing book uh, for 2011 to date. Uh, she has done a number of other co-written books, uh, Road Trip Nation, A Guide to Discovering Your Path in Life, I need to read that, um, Rules of the Red Rubber Ball, Closing the Engagement Gap, How Great Companies Unlock Employee Performance for Superior Results, and her own book, uh, I guess this was six or seven years ago, this came out, it was called Be Happy at Work. It was a profile of 100 women who love their jobs, have often uh, uh, won that happiness to, um, by overcoming significant adversity and offers prescriptive advice. Uh, I had a sort of a arm's length uh, relationship with that book. It was fascinating to watch and to watch Joanne work with her many contributors. For seven years uh, before she undertook this new uh, uh, position in life, uh, Joanne worked as a reporter, a writer, and a contributing editor at the New York office of Forbes magazine. Her magazine writing has appeared variously in uh, uh, Portfolio.com from Condé Nast, uh, Working Mother, Cosmo Girl, Seventeen, Boston Magazine, MSN.com, and the Wall Street Journal's National Business Employment Weekly. Uh, her television appearances include The Today Show, Forbes on Fox, CNN Financial, and Chicago Tonight. Uh, and then prior to her, uh, prior, prior to her writing career, uh, she worked in business-to-business -business, uh, communications at Accenture and Burson Marsteller. Now, um, the most important thing, certainly one of the most important things, is that uh, she's ours. Uh, Joanne received her MSJ, or master's degree, uh, in 1997, uh, and she was an outstanding student. She uh, was the uh, publisher of the magazine project, which that, I guess it would have been spring, uh, the publication was Today's Smart Parent. Uh, she received at graduation the Rance Crane Scholarship, uh, one of the distinctive uh, honors that we give to our students. And um, she came to us originally with a bachelor's degree in journalism from Indiana University. Now, a couple more things about her. Um, uh, she was in my law class uh, way back then. And because I see 200 students a year, I don't remember that many of them. But uh, Joanne made this impression that very few students do. Um, I used to be a managing editor. I used to hire people. And so I look at people, and one of my first thoughts is, would I hire you? Yeah. Uh, this is a woman who I knew right away struck me as poised, professional, classy. I'm sure that's partly uh, because of her parents. So if I might ask David and Virginia Gordon to please stand so we can say hello to you. Thank you. Joanne grew up in uh, Highland Park and uh, uh, spent a decade after leaving us working in New York City, as I told you. She's now in Seattle. Uh, 
and uh, she's with us today. So if you would please welcome Joanne Gordon. Wow, this, this is like, this is your life. Um, thank you so much, Craig. Craig was a tremendous um, professor and I had so many great teachers when I was here. Um, and again, being back here, I can't believe it's been 15 years. And um, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be asked to speak today, not only because of the incredible caliber of alumni and professionals who have spoken here before, uh, but because my decision to attend Medill back in 1997 not only changed my career, but it changed the course of my life, as I assume for the students who are here, it is going to change yours. So given that my current career manifestation as a ghostwriter or book collaborator is not a common journalistic path, um, I wanted to first focus on less on that specific job and a little bit more about the journey that brought me to this point, because I think within my journey are hopefully some lessons and perhaps some guideposts and things that I picked up that will guide your journey, whatever phase that you are on, um, and inspire and inform you. A lot of us, you know, Craig, you're about to go to Qatar, and we all hope that's public knowledge. Uh, <laughs> but we all have, um, you know, we all have different points in our life as we evolve. So the question before a lot of you now, if you're students, is how will you work and write when you graduate for years to come? And while many of you may be sure of the path you want, newspaper reporter, I talked to a class today, marketing, uh, my guess is that that will likely change. Uh, and not after, only after a few years, and then maybe even a few years after that. The good news, I think, for people who want to go into publishing is that despite the evolving, and some would say devolving, state of publishing, there remain many, many different ways to be a writer. Certainly more ways than I was aware of when I uh, went to both college and came here 20 years ago. The bad news is that not all of these ways are going to be obvious to you right now. And the trick, I think, to finding the writing life best suited for you is to connect the dots. So when you look back on your life, it's not just a string of random jobs, but ideally a full picture of a fulfilling career. And the best that I as an alumnus can do is to just share my own experience. The truth is that our profession has no right path, and I think that's true for any profession. The only wrong path I have come to believe is not to follow your own voice. By voice, I don't just mean how you write, I don't just mean the words on the page or how you personally use language. By voice, I do not only mean the tone and flavor of the written word. By voice, I am talking about your internal voice, and that includes an amalgam of elements your values, your interests, your likes and your dislikes, your strengths as well as your weaknesses, and your passions. I think we find our voice over time, and at least for me, that was and continues to be the case. Every job I've had, every assignment, helps me answer some very crucial questions that I did not in college or in graduate school even know that I needed to ask, but each informs my next step. So like many of you, I started writing as a kid, but unlike many of you, generationally speaking, I typed my first big story on a vintage blue Smith Corona Corsair typewriter. I single spaced the whole thing on the back and front of white non-recyclable typewriter paper. Uh, the book that I wrote was titled, It Is Not Easy Going on 12, because it is not. I don't care what generation you're from. And I did send it to Judy Bloom and received a very nice form letter back. My other favorite childhood hobby was to spy on friends and occasionally neighbors. Uh, not maliciously, I just liked burrowing in the bushes or hiding behind a corner and watching people like a fly on the wall. And it's fair to say that I was an observer before I was a writer or a journalist. In college, I majored in journalism at Indiana University, but the economy when I graduated in 1991 was about as lousy as it is today. So being the practical young woman, that I was, I applied for both marketing and journalism jobs. And I accepted my first job offer because no offense, mom and dad, I wanted to move out of the basement into the city of Chicago. So for $19,000 a year, I worked at a tiny PR agency and wrote press releases uh, and marketing material. And I pitched stories to reporters over the phone and I dreaded it. I was not good at it. My heart wanted to be writing rather than selling stories. 
So after six years of climbing a career ladder that I had never really intended to climb, I applied to Medill and really had absolutely no idea if I would get in. Three weeks after, I joyously opened my acceptance letter, and today I wonder if they just only come by email. I was still unsure whether to go. Uh, I was nervous to change careers and start from scratch, and I had no money. I would have to take out student loans. It seemed to me to be a tremendous risk. Then something happened. I was working for a big PR company, and my boss was 42 years old. He was charismatic, extremely smart, but always seemed to be running around at a frazzled pace that suggested he was never quite where he was supposed to be. And one morning, he just did not show up for work. Ordinarily, Dan was the first person in the office. He was the last person out. And his assistant called me at my desk. Uh, Dan is dead, was all she said. That is when I decided what, that what comes off as a cliche is actually quite true, that life is too short not to do work that makes us happy. Not, I don't mean happy work, that is different, but work that uses and grows our skills, reflects our values, and engages us with people we like and respect. So I quit my job, and I took out student loans, and I moved to Evanston from Chicago, and I lived on a budget of $11 a day in Evanston. Uh, I was the second oldest student in my class, I bought a used Macintosh for $250 uh, from the tech department, and I worked harder in graduate school than I had ever worked at any job in my life. But, I mean, my short life at the time, I mean, I was only 28. But I did feel like I was on vacation. I felt like I was on a sabbatical, because when you're doing what you love, it doesn't feel like work. I focused on business reporting, and every day I learned something new about writing and about myself. First of all, I disliked daily deadlines, and I was not good at them. So newspaper reporting was out of the question. That wasn't for me. Magazines seemed like a better place to go. And I was also still interested in business as a topic, not as a practitioner. I liked dissecting complex ideas. I liked putting complex language into ideas that other people could digest and understand. And I think my firsthand business experience working in offices having both good and lousy bosses increased my fascination with what made leaders succeed or fail. So as Craig mentioned, I was publisher of the magazine. And doing that, I learned something else about myself. And that is, I did not enjoy managing people. Not that I wasn't good at it, but I was definitely more energized by corralling ideas and hurting people. But I will say that I do consider it a personal source of pride that the people I was trapped in a room with for three months uh, to manage, I can still call many of them my friends to this day. I also knew that when I graduated, I had to support myself financially and then pay off those loans. And I realized that the most secure jobs for a writer were at business magazines because those, at least back then, were the only publications that had staff writers. Most of all, the magazines based in New York uh, hire freelancers. So after graduating here on a very clear summer day, I moved straight to New York with $1,500 in my bank account. Sorry, it makes it sound much more dramatic if I only had $15. With $1,500 in my bank account, thanks to the, the, uh, the award, I was really grateful to receive that from the Crane Foundation. My first job was at a retail trade magazine. And for $36,000 a year, I wrote feature articles about companies like Saks Fifth Avenue or GameStop. And I also wrote opinion columns about America's malls. Personally, I do not like the mall. Uh, but sometimes, as most of you know in this audience, and many of you are going to find out, we have to take jobs that are not our ideal so that we can get to where we ideally want to go. And that is true, I think, for any profession, absolutely not just journalism. My editor was generous, and he gave me a long line from which I could either run and explore or hang myself. And the first big story was a profile about the founder of Bloomingdale's, uh, Marvin Traub. I knew I was interviewing an icon, which is why when I returned to my office, I essentially almost died when I realized that my tape recorder had stopped after the first five minutes of this man's generous time. And that was the day I learned another big lesson. Always carry two tape recorders, extra batteries, and take notes just in case. Uh, Meanwhile, in New York, I pursued my big goal. I, was really, I really wanted to work for either Fortune, Forbes, or Business Week. And I asked almost everyone I knew, Medill alumni, professors, family, friends, my dentist, whether they knew anyone who worked at one of the big three business magazines. 
Now stay with me on this. A family friend who happens to be in the audience today, her son had a college buddy whose friend used to work at Forbes. I asked her for lunch in Manhattan and we hit it off and she put me in touch with her friend who was the assistant to the woman in charge of hiring reporters. Whew. I met the assistant for an informational interview. There were no jobs available at the time. And again, we hit it off. And weeks later, I got a call to interview for a newly opened reporter position, and I got the job. I took a pay cut, yes, a pay cut of $36,000 a year uh, to start as a reporter for Forbes. And despite the marble staircase and the gilded frames of the Forbes brothers in the hallway, it was not glamorous work. Like most reporters at Forbes, I started as a fact checker. My job along with 25 other fact checker reporters, and I will say that I do not believe the fact checking pool today uh, exists at Forbes, was to look at every article about 24 hours before it went to press. They gave us a lot of time for this job, and our goal was to verify all the facts in the article so that it, when it came out, nothing would be wrong, and they wouldn't receive angry letters, and so on, so on and forth. We had to make sure every name was spelled right, that every job title was correct, that every company's revenues and earnings were accurate, and those were the easy things to verify. Every single word in that article had to be accounted for, always backed by a primary source or by a reporter's very uh, diligent notes. And the process was always this sort of last minute frenzy of phone calls and red pens, and it almost typically went into the early morning hours until in a daze you're kind of stumbling out of the Forbes building at 3 a.m. in the morning hailing a cab. Um, yes, it was great insurance against libel and defamation, Craig. But it also made me a much more careful and thoughtful writer because, well, A, I was able to dissect stories from much more experienced journalists than I and see how they, um, both how they sourced and how they, how they formed their stories. Uh, but I also was, became aware of how potentially sloppy even the most talented reporters can get. And especially when you know someone else is checking your work, you just, and I did this too when I was a reporter, you say, oh, we'll get it in fact checking. So it's easy to misinterpret complex ideas, and it's also easy to accidentally write that a, report, that a CEO is 57 instead of 58. And what I learned through that whole process is that there are no small mistakes. Get even a basic thing wrong, and it calls everything else you write into question. So at Forbes, it was generally known that being a great fact checker would not get you promoted, but being a bad checker would get you absolutely nowhere. So Forbes editors also pounded into me the craft of storytelling. Show, don't tell was a mantra, as I know it is for all the students here. We could not write, for example, that the CEO was angry. We had to show him pounding his fist on the desk. I also learned to write a Forbes story. Unlike traditional, unbiased newspaper reporting, we had to have an opinion about every company or every leader that we profiled, and we had to back it up by facts. Did I think a CEO would succeed or fail? Did I think the stock would grow or tank? Pick a side and then prove it. And because, I mean, let's be honest, I'm 30 years old, and you know, what do I know? But you learn to think that you know a lot. One of my best editors taught me the art of brevity, that less, that less is more. And I, I could hand him a story, and he could probably easily edit about 25% out of it and make it stronger. I should have said in the speech, I was thinking as I was reading this earlier. I also spent a season researching the infamous Forbes 400, the list of the country's wealthiest individuals. Now, this is a very fascinating experience, because there I'd be sitting in a cubicle eating my lunch out of a brown paper bag, calculating how many billions of dollars iconic business people like Donald Trump would be worth that year. And one day I thought to myself, Ugh, who cares how much money these people have? Are they happy? So I came up with this idea. Why not create a list of the happiest workers in America instead of the richest? And in my head, I called it the Happy 100. And I thought it sounded like a really interesting idea. I could just see the Forbes cover, cover the Happy 100. But my editors were not nearly as interested in it. But I personally wouldn't let it go. Uh, so one day, I had been at Forbes for many years, several years, and after I had successfully escaped the fact-checking pool, I got a call from a literary agent on the phone. And she called to ask me about a small story that I had written. It was an article about two recent college grads named Mike Mariner and Nathan Gebhardt. They were traveling around the country in a big blue and green RV, interviewing leaders like Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz about how they had found their own path in life. The, whoops, the boy's goal was to encourage other young people 
not to compromise when it came to their careers and instead go out and talk to people they admired and find out what all the possible options could be for their own life, life's work. The duo, they called themselves Road Trip Nation. And I'm wondering if anyone in here has heard of Road Trip Nation. I'm not surprised. I mean, they currently have a documentary on, uh, they currently have a documentary on PBS, and since then they've grown into a pretty large company, a nice sized company. Uh, the literary agent asked me if the boys were working on a book, and I remember I sat up in my chair and I said, no, but they want to, and I want to be their writer. And a few days later, I sat across from the literary agent in her office, and after discussing what a book for Road Trip Nation could look like, I casually changed the subject, and I told her about this idea I had about the Happy 100, and her eyebrows raised, and she said to me, we'll do it after Road Trip Nation. And she said this to me as if it was reality and not some dream, as if I was already an established author and I could do it, and I believed her, which is how I not quite accidentally began to move from magazine writer to author. Uh, within the next month, I collaborated with Mike and Nate on a book proposal, and we received an offer from Ballantine Books. And this is why I'm telling you the story, because I remember very specifically being in a stationery store in New York picking out wedding invitations when I got a call from my agent that a publisher wanted to buy the book and that my portion of the book's advance, which is the money that the publisher would pay to us to write the book, my portion would pay for my student loans and I would be married, getting married debt free. I was not the only person who was happy with that information. I took a three month leave from Forbes to write the book and what I realized during that time was that I really enjoyed helping Mike and Nate articulate their ideas in a way that was true to their voice and true to their experiences, but also helping them package in a way that was interesting for readers. I had never written a book before, and the process seemed to come to me very naturally, sort of like putting together a puzzle, but someone has thrown away the top of the box, um, and I thrived on the challenge. I also believed in their mission, and this was a critical realization for me, because I decided that working with Mike and Nate versus writing about them just felt more authentic. Essentially, we shared the same goal, to help recent, recent college grads create exhilarating, uncompromised working lives. And while it was not journalism, per se, it was not that much different than writing for Forbes, in that I had an opinion, I was expressing it with facts and primary sources. After the book was launched, Ballantyne, the same publisher that did Road Trip Nation, bought my book, The Happy 100, and I took a year off to write it, and it was a truly a labor of love. Because I wasn't paid that much, but it was a labor of love. Six weeks before it was published, another labor of love, my son, also came into the world. And often when I look back on the year of 2005, I say I gave birth to a hard copy and a soft copy at the same time. Um, so The Happy 100 was published, and I learned something else that's very important, at least for me as a writer, that the book's publication was actually anticlimactic after racing towards a finish line. When you write, especially a book, there is no one moment when you cross the line and break the tape and know that you've achieved something. For that matter, I think publishing anything, an article or a column, is a really quiet event. We're not there as writers when our work is being absorbed unless you happen to see someone reading it on the subway or the bus. Book parties come and go, magazines and newspapers get thrown out and websites get refreshed hourly. So unlike musicians who can stand on a stage and really watch people enjoying their work, being a writer is a lonely job. So I think we really must believe in what we're doing and why. When no one is looking, when no one cares, we have to like the process, even when it's painful, which is a good deal of the time. I think the lasting rewards of writing are mostly intrinsic. So by 2005, the time had come for me to balance parenthood with my writing career. I had done more than 100 pieces for Forbes, and I finally felt confident in my own opinions uh, about the stories I wanted to tell and how I wanted to tell them. I was growing to trust my own voice, and the time had come to move on. Flash forward three more books and a cross-country move, and I was in Seattle when I received a phone call that Howard Schultz, who as a kid grew up in the poor projects of Brooklyn and moved to Seattle after college and grown Starbucks from 11 stores into this global organization, wanted to interview me for his second book about his returning as the company's CEO and turning the company around. It was a little bit of a twist of fate because Howard had heard about me from the very literary agents who had worked with Road Trip Nation on our book, and I was really intrigued to spend some time with him. 
Um, I mean, when I was at Forbes, I'd be lucky if I got to spend more than two hours with the CEO in a room. And if I was interviewing him for a story, he would still be flanked by PR people and he would have his talking points uh, crafted for me to digest. But being able to sit with someone and write a book with them meant a much more, to me, you know, authentic experience in terms of really understanding what they're thinking. And I was intrigued to write with him. But I'd never taken on such a high pro profile project and I figured that the job would absolutely go to someone else who had. And so I walked into Howard's office thinking I would have a really nice hour with the Starbucks CEO and that would be that. But it wasn't. Howard holds most of his meetings in his office around a coffee table on comfortable chairs, not across from a wooden desk. He served us, someone, well, he served us coffee, and I asked for milk in mine, which I later learned was a sacrilege. Uh, and as we were talking, Howard leaned in and asked me questions about my background, my family, my passions, why had I become a writer. He did not ask me if I had written a bestseller. He did not ask me what other business leaders I had worked with. He was interested in me as a person, not as a writer for hire. And my sixth sense by now had grown to the point that just talking with him about what he hoped to achieve with this book, I knew this was a puzzle that I had wanted to piece together. And I, when I returned home, I emailed Howard directly and I told him point blank I wanted to be his writer. A few weeks after I landed the job, I was sitting in the first of what would be many meetings with Howard and his senior leadership team, an eight hour monthly affair that they, um, through which I would sit uh, and listen and take notes, a fly on the wall of the boardroom spying. During the break, I stood up and I remember looking out these large picture windows in the office that looked out onto the ports of Seattle. And I just thought about how much, how, what so much of my life and so many of the things that I had done in my life had kind of led me to this particular job. And it just felt so right. The project took me places that I had never been, to China, to Japan, inside a coffee bean roasting plant. If you want to know anything about coffee, I'm your woman and behind the scenes of one of the world's most well-known businesses and into the mind of someone, one of the most successful entrepreneurs. It was a level of insight into how companies and leaders operate that I had not before been privy, despite having profiled so many companies. And ultimately, the book Onward, which was named after a word that Howard has used to sign off on his memos to employees since 1990, 19, uh, 1991, tells the story of the company's turnaround from the point of view of its chief. And I approached it with the same reporting rigor that I would use to write a Forbes story. Not only a show don't tell philosophy that led us to write the book as a chronological narrative versus a chronicle of business advice, but also with a commitment to accurately reporting Howard and his colleagues' experiences. In addition to spending countless hours interviewing Howard and speaking with him, I spoke to dozens of other people who worked with Starbucks for their own perspectives and their recollections and their expertise. And I fact-checked everything, all 120,000 words. Uh, before Onward, the book went, before it went to press. And I still do this for all my writing. I, you know, just because you dislike a tedious, time-consuming process, there's no excuse not to do it. And fact-checking, did I lose it? Are we good? OK. So again, I am just, I'm adamant in the fact-checking process, whether or not my editors even ask me to do it. Ultimately, Howard was an excellent, respectful writing partner. He's a natural storyteller and a clear communicator that helped his voice translate easily to the page. I think as writers, finding our true voice is a process that is as much about listening to ourselves as it is about listening to our writing. So now I look at some of the students and I ask you, what is your voice? I don't think you can fully know the answer to this question yet. It will change over the course of your career as you take on different experiences and as you try on different jobs, as you hone your skills, as you mature and you become to know yourself better. Are you an idea generator, a constant font of information and ideas and new material? Or do you prefer to wrestle one big idea to the ground for weeks or months or a year? Do you thrive under deadlines or does the tick tock of the clock freeze your brain? Do you fret over every sentence or do words fly out of your fingertips like butterflies, carefree and unlikely to come back to haunt you? And are you good at managing your time? Are you good at managing other people? And do you even like people? What is your mission? To entertain, to inform, to expose, to assist, to impress, to win a Pulitzer, to stroke your ego, to tell stories, to make a living? Can your opinions keep to themselves or do they have to shout themselves from the headlines? Now here's a question that I ask everybody who tells me that they want to write a book. 
What is your definition of success? Now be honest with yourself, even if you don't like the answer, because your answer will guide you. It has the power to determine what you write, when you write, how you write, for whom you write, and why you write. The opportunities before you are absolutely infinite. You can and will land your dream job, even if you don't know what that dream job is yet. And bear in mind, a dream job is different than a perfect job. There are no perfect jobs. You may not land that dream job tomorrow or next year, but the more carefully you listen to your inner voice throughout the years and connect the dots of your interests, to your values, to your skills, the more likely I really think you are to lead a fulfilling writing life. Thank you so much. So we are now on here, right? Okay. This is the plan here. I'm going to talk with Joanne a little bit, ask her some questions, and, uh, and then uh, we're going to have audience questions as well. So uh, there's no need to divide this up uh, in any particular way. So uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand and uh, I'll acknowledge you. And uh, someone around there with a microphone who delivered to you. But um, uh, if I'll exercise my prerogative as MC here to start. First of all, thanks. Uh, I was thinking as you were speaking about our conversation at lunch about the pejorative uh, uh, meaning that somehow seems to attach the word ghostwriter. And, uh, and then I was thinking about the kinds of books that are often ghostwritten. Uh, I was remembering Charles Barkley once complaining about being misquoted in his autobiography. Okay, well that's, the, that's different. That's not what you do. Uh, you do something that, as I described, is uh, you bring these journalistic skills to bear, but you bring a real sense you're working with, you know, powerful people uh, in uh, politics and business. Um, and so, as I said, not everyone can do this work. I think it takes a special personality and temperament. Uh, because I can only imagine working with the kinds of people you have. You are part psychologist, you are a life coach, you are a confidant, and you're the boss, man. You've got a contract here, and this baby's due, and uh, you've got to do your part. That must be an interesting conversation to have the CEO go to work. So, um, it's how like do you, begging them. <laughs> well, how do you when you like when you met Howard or when you meet any of your clients? Mm -hmm. This is a relationship you're about to enter. Yeah. How do you size them up? What are you looking for? Um, I think I'm looking for someone who will be a respectful partner in the process because while I'm working for them. Um, I have to own this process. They're looking for me to do what I, they're hiring me for an expertise. They're looking for me to do what um, I know how to do and they want me to guide them. Uh, and that has to be a respectful relationship. I think like Howard, I'm, I'm looking, like Howard was looking to me, I think more for my character perhaps. I was looking for someone who would know that I had responsibilities and we had deadlines and who would help me meet them and who would be responsive and who would be authentic and sincere and communicative. And I knew his reputation, and again, I think you have to size people up when you meet them and get a sense that this is someone that I, I, can, I can really partner with, I can work with. And when you work with these folks, uh, you, uh, well, you're obviously in Seattle. Uh, do you talk to them on the phone? Do you exchange uh, emails? Do you tell them you need to do 300 words today? Well, every, every project is different. And it, I, the Howard was the first time I worked with somebody that I was in the same city as I was. But I let the author's uh, preference for communicating guide the process. Some people are better at writing. I had one person who I just wrote by pen. I said, write your life story. And he wrote it in pencil or in pen on dozens and dozens of pages. Uh, and my only assignment to them is not to edit yourself. My job is to turn you upside down like a salt shaker and get everything out of your head. I don't care how it comes out. My job is to put it together in a way, in a way that other pe that'll be digestible for other people. But I just want to know the raw version of them. What words would they choose? And so whatever is most comfortable for them. Sometimes it's, you know, I had one woman I worked with, and I'd say, tell me. Write, please write down everything you ever thought about sexual harassment in the workplace. And she would just type me an email and it would come over. With Howard, um, we worked best, he was best verbally, so luckily I had an office in their offices and I would just say, I need 10 minutes to talk with you a little bit on, on China or a topic. And to his credit, he always made the time to do it. He prioritized the project and, you know, I would, but also I have to be respectful of their time. I have to go in say my piece, get what I need, and get out. Okay. 
Now, somewhere in your early meetings with these folks, you're in your head working on a narrative. Uh, no matter how smart people are, uh, they don't always understand narrative. Never mind what a big project, a book is, voice. That's your job. So how, when do you start looking at them and saying, OK, this is the story I see shaping up. Um, this is uh, the voice I hear coming out of you. This is what I'm going to fashion. Well, again, I, I let the material, uh, I have to be true to the story and to reality and to the information. And some of my books have been more advice or content driven than story driven. So first, like I say, I want to shake them upside down and see all the puzzle pieces. Let me see everything. And then figure out what is the best way to package everything in a way, I mean, I think I'm very aware that readers Time is short, they bought a book, what's in it for me? What's the promise that this book is gonna give me? So what's the best way to package your information in a way that's authentic and true to you, but also give something back to the readers? And sometimes it's not a narrative. In Starbucks' case, I think we went into it, Howard and I saying, he just said, I wanna tell this story. It was an, it was an amazing, tension-filled time in our lives, and I'm really proud of the people who, who worked here and made it happen, but the story, we, I, the story was so good that we just told it chronologically, that that's what the story demanded. And other times, the book, The Happy 100, I mean, sometimes it's not chronological. It's let's just talk about the lessons and let's organize things in terms of lessons and hopefully there'll be stories to articulate them. Did they, uh, I imagine some of the folks you work with uh, already have an idea of what their story is, what the narrative is. And other people, I mean, they, they, they have all this anecdotes that you're going to dump on the table and put together. Um, it, uh, some of these folks, you, you must need to sort of um, drive them differently. Uh, there's a struggle for control in any writing process. And there's an editor, let's not forget an editor, back mm -hmm. at the plant. So how does that uh, part of it work? Well, for the most part, I've been very uh, lucky with the people that I have worked with. and. You know, I just seem to, maybe someone like listens to music and plays by ear, I just sort of have an intuitive sense sometimes about how a project should go or how to work with someone. I mean, I don't, there's often not, this week we'll be done with chapter two and this will be done with chapter three. You know, you could all of a sudden hit a glitch where chapter 15 ain't working. And you always know that you could hit that bump that could derail everything. And so, I think there is, a, even though the deadline, I might not be good with daily deadlines, and boy, to have a deadline in a year, that seems like you have so much time. But that clock does tick quickly, and again, you never know when all of a sudden you're in big trouble. So um, I think to your, to your question, I just uh, try to read the situation and let it unfold. Uh, when I've written books, sometimes I realize the best place to start is in the middle somewhere. Um, because uh, it's just, you need a place to start, and this yeah. is the place that's suddenly rich yeah. and fertile. Yeah. Same thing here, where? I think so. I think, again, even like writing an article, you're looking for your lead. What is the, is there one experience that sums up the big story and the big point of the book? And again, how are you going to get people interested in it? And sometimes, as with Howard's, we kind of began with a, something that happened in the middle, and then we went back a little bit. Um, and then we backed up, and then it was you know chronological. And there was going back in time. Um, but I think to your point, you're right. You have to sometimes beginning in the middle is where you start. By the time you're done, or as they exhausted as you are. Oh, so most people when they write a book say they never want to do it again, and uh, I think that's really true. So yes, they're, they're they usually think they're more exhausted than me, but they're not. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, now, one of the things that happens when you write for. Uh, anybody, I guess, but certainly powerful people in business, politics, what have you, they have the natural conceit of imagining that their version of events is the correct one. And you just said that you have to go out and, you know, for everybody's good, uh, you check it all out. Well, I, I have come to say that I think truth is a moving target in memory. And I guess why I approach a lot of books as a reporter. I just interview a lot of people to get a sense, you know, f to fill in um, some of the just gaps perhaps of the main people who are telling my story and um, you know in the case of Starbucks the dozens of people I interviewed at the company just to help me tell the story of you know in addition to what Howard was saying and I think sometimes you say um, oh you know I've heard from a couple people that this also may have been the way things you know that said in that meeting oh you're right I just I mean how can you okay. remember everything so it's my job to realize that memory is imperfect okay do you ever get, well, here's the situation. I can imagine an event uh, where whatever happened, there was also the news accounts of what happened, and sure. they're out there. Oh. And so you have to deal with them in some way. Of course. And, uh, uh, so 
some, how do you negotiate those sort of more difficult conversations? Well, I'll be honest. I don't. I didn't. I haven't really had to do that because I do. I also read everything that was written on. Um, you know, uh, I do external research too. And you're looking at. The, I look at the stock price. I think I had an outline of. Starbucks's history, and there's a stock price at every point of you know correlating the stock price to what was going on at the company, but there was no, there wasn't a lot of those conversations at this point didn't really have to happen. In this situation, it didn't really have to happen. And again, my goal is I know this something's going to come out, and I say this is true for anything, an article, a book. Everyone who knew what knows what really happened is going to read this book, and you don't want anyone to raise their hand and say that is false. That is wrong. So let's write a book that people may interpret the exact same accident differently, but let's get it as accurate as we can. Okay. Let's talk about the business side of this. I think this fascinates me. Who approaches whom? You described your situation uh, with Howard. Who approaches whom? Uh, 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 the, the, an agent, an editor comes to you and says, "This person out here is looking for someone." I think there's no there's no one way that this happens in this business except that someone says, "I want to write a book," and then they find an agent. And if they think that they need a ghostwriter, the agent will help try to find a writer or collaborator for that project. I mean, sometimes you can meet people through friends. Um, I think for the engagement book I did with a big consulting firm, I had written some art an article about their research, and I believe that there was a whole book in bringing that research to life. And I approached them and I said, I think we could do this. But on the whole, no one should be talked into writing a book. If you say, I think you should really write a book and I want to help you, yeah. that is a kiss of death because a book is so much work and it's such a wrestling thing that you better love it so when the going gets tough, you're completely in it. So you have to almost have to wait for it for someone to come. Now, an agent, I think a lot of it's through the agents. The agents put together the deal. The agents talk to each other. So the author and I can get down to the business of writing. Now, is it after, that, after you have been partnered with whomever, that's when the agent goes and sells the book? Um, no, in most cases, you write a book proposal. And yeah. then the agents are responsible for helping you find publisher for that book. So you'll write a book proposal that essentially says, this is what the book will say. This is what it will sound like. It's a sales document. This is who will buy it. This is why people will buy it. This is why they'll care. And then in the case of Road Trip Nation, you know, and even with Howard, we just visited a lot of publishers. Now, do you write the uh, proposal? Oh, yeah. You're in oh, it okay. for that, too. So you're sort of, uh, there's this midwifery going on. You're put together with potential yes, clients. And then, and then you put together the well, you know, the, we're gonna the go proposal sell. is a really, it's not just a little document. It actually is an outline for the entire book. I mean, you also almost have to find the voice and the story in the proposal because that's going to be your map. So, um, you know, I think you had asked me earlier just in general about, you know, literally like the, the fee structures of it. Yeah. It's very similar to publishing. In publishing, publishers will often give an advance for a book and they will pay it over the course of the book's um, writing life. And in the case for me, I, my business relationship is usually directly with the authors. So they're responsible for you know, paying me or my, my money relationship is with them. They will have the direct relationship with the publisher. Okay. And you know, that will usually it will begin. But so also it's not, it's not stipulated in the contract necessarily? There's an advance and so forth? It sometimes, say. I mean, typically, um, you know, there are lots of different ways to structure these things, and typically authors receive royalties after their advance is paid out. And so a, a, someone who's a ghostwriter or collaborator can possibly get a portion of the royalties, or maybe they can just get a big upfront fee. Okay. Depends. I mean, they're all different okay. ways to structure it. Is there ever a discussion about how the names will appear on the title, with as opposed we to We talked and? about this at lunch. Yeah. And to me, it's subtle, but and with says is saying I had someone you know work with me on this, but this is my book, and in Howard's case, it, it is Howard's book, and um, so to me, a with is just also his being generous and saying you know this is someone who also put a lot of work into this, and Howard, I mean he has a phrase that just says success is best when shared, and I just I reap the benefits of that in terms of his generosity, also in terms of you know giving credit, giving me giving me credit. And, um, but I think and is more when you're both content partners in it yeah. versus, um, if that makes sense, versus more like the one who's helping shape it and take the content yeah, into the form. Yeah, to me it, brings you, it means you bring knowledge and skills that just the transcriptionist does not. No, I, I think so. I mean, you, you're not just, you know, ghostwriting isn't just, oh, I listen, I transcribe, I rearrange the quotes. I mean, it's, you're writing a book and a story, you just have a big source yeah. who's in it with you. Okay. Um, are there, 
what kind of relationships would not work? I mean, there's got to be folks out there who, uh, of all types, who want to write a book, uh, but you would meet them and say, okay, this relationship is not going to work. I think if you really have nothing of interest to say, if you only want to write the book for your ego or just to have fame, or if you're a disrespectful person. Okay. You're not a respectful person of other people's time, of their, you know, if you're not a professional person as well, okay. just in your behaviors. Uh, have you met such people? Have you walked away from anything? No, I mean, I haven't, I, I've had one project that didn't go the way we thought it would go, and at some point you say, boy, we really still, it's like a marriage, we really still like each other, but we're just not in love anymore, so, um, you know, let's call it a day. Uh, but no, I've never, but it was still incredibly <coughs> respectful on both sides, and, you know, it's, it's a very intimate kind of relationship, this okay. process.